Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be going through part two of my Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde Ultimate Study Guide series. Super excited to share this with you. I've been working really hard in the background to make this content for you. So we're going to dive straight in. What we have to do first, if you haven't already seen uh, part one, is you'll need to download the study guide. So the way that you do that is you go to my website, www.gcseenglishexperts.com, click on freebies. You'll see in the freebie section, there's this study guide. You can click on the study guide. It will bring you to this article and you can download all my free study guides. You can also request a study guide for a book you're doing if I haven't already done a study guide for that. And that will then download it and bring you to the study guide itself. Okay, and this is a PDF file completely free of charge. We're starting with chapter three. We went through chapter one and chapter two in part one. So if you haven't seen that, go and check that out. And chapter three is called Dr. Jekyll was quite at ease. And in this chapter, what happens is Dr. Jekyll dismisses Mr. Utterson's concerns for him and assures him that he can handle Mr. Hyde. Now, Mr. Hyde is a very strange guy. In chapter one, he trampled on a little girl. In chapter two, he meets Mr. Utterson and Mr. Utterson is freaked out by him basically and he has an instant dislike of Mr. Hyde. In the first video, we talked about how that could be a representation of the id, the ego, and the superego, which is like psychological uh, knowledge from Freud. And that's fantastic context to include in your exam essays. But now Mr. Utterson goes to Dr. Jekyll and he says, hang on a minute, but Dr. Jekyll, I've known you my whole life. Why are you dealing with this Mr. Hyde guy? He seems evil. He doesn't seem in our, to be a Victorian gentleman and within our circles. And Dr. Jekyll doesn't really give Mr. Utterson a reason. He just says, don't worry, I can handle it. Now it gets a bit deeper than that because Dr. Jekyll actually has a will now, a will and testimony. So if Dr. Jekyll was to die, Mr. Hyde is actually written in the will to be the one that gets all of Dr. Jekyll's fortune. And Dr. Jekyll's a wealthy man. So that also seems quite mysterious. Um, so they're having this dinner party and Mr. Utterson talks to Dr. Jekyll about that. The most important quote from this uh, chapter three is Dr. Jekyll saying, the moment I choose, I can be rid of Mr. Hyde. It creates a sense of foreshadowing of the idea that the relationship between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a bit strange and there's like a power dynamic and a fight for control. And I would also say that it links to one of the fatal flaws in Dr. Jekyll. So again, we've got a little story time here, just in case you don't know what a fatal flaw is. The fancy word for fatal flaw is hamartia, and hamartia basically means a, uh, a quality within a character that is deadly to them, okay? So in this case, Dr. Jekyll has a fatal flaw or hamartia, which is pride and arrogance. The fancy word for that is hubris. I hope that I edit this to actually put the words in because otherwise I'm going to look silly. But anyway, hubris. And it's this idea that Dr. Jekyll thinks that he's in control of this situation, yet he isn't. The major theme then is control and duality. Uh, the other thing that this links to though, in terms of context, is the idea that there is this real tension in Victorian society because the 1800s were filled with all these scientific discoveries, right? But people were quite worried about some of these scientific discoveries and what limits we might be pushing as humans with these advances in science. And especially because the Victorian era was like idolizing and, and focused on self-control. Back then, a woman couldn't even show any part of her like shoulders or ankles or anything because it was seen to be like not appropriate. That's the kind of level of restriction that people had in the Victorian era that you, you can't even walk out of your house with your socks off by accident in the morning or something. Otherwise, everyone would think that you're terrible, yeah? So there was this restraint in society in lots of ways, and yet science was pushing the boundaries of what we were doing. And so there was a great deal of fear about what that might bring in the future. So we're into chapter four. This is the Carew murder case. And in the part one video, I mentioned how this is like a murder mystery novel in the end. But up to this point, we haven't had a murder, right? We do now have a murder. So Mr. Hyde brutally murders an elected government official called Sir Danvers Carew. And this would have been incredibly shocking throughout London society. And the maid who saw the, the murder firsthand fainted at the sight of the violence of Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde like viciously killed this man. He didn't just like, you know, unalive him. He literally beat him to death in the streets of London and then continued to beat his dead body with a cane in the streets of London. So this is pretty vicious stuff. 
the major quote is obviously going to be from that murder scene. So Mr. Hyde then all of a sudden broke out in a great flame of anger, stamping with his foot. And I'm talking about stamping on Mr. Sir Danver Crew's body, right? Stamping on his, de his dying body. It's very gory graphic imagery and it shows just how violent and savage Mr. Hyde is. Now, the dark sort of deep thought that comes from this is thinking about the savagery that we have in our own lives, whether there would be things that we would be willing to kill for or kill over. There is certainly a part of our brain, which I mentioned called the id, which if it were allowed to do whatever it wanted, would quite likely harm or maybe even kill people in the pursuit of food and sleep and survival and reproduction and stuff like that. So it's really quite scary. It links to the fact that the Victorian era was filled with more and more criminal behavior, more and more degeneration. And there was this like underbelly of urban life in Victorian London that was actually filled with alcoholism and drugs, particularly things like cocaine and opium, prostitution, all of this stuff was going on in the back streets of London. And Robert Louis Stevenson talks about that several times. As a matter of fact, let's finish with this thought. If you think about chapter one, the way that Mr. Enfield describes the evil of Mr. Hyde is down a back alley where schoolboys have been using knives to carve into the molding. And there are just like these people in the background. We get the sense that prostitution goes on down there, everything like that. So this is one of the essential things that is happening in London society. This is another duality. That's a big part of this novel, right? There's the duality of the Victorian gentleman and gentlewomen, the lords and ladies and stuff, that are meant to be perfect. They're meant to look perfect, groomed, respectable, everything, right? And yet you've got this seedy underbelly and you just know that some of the Victorian gentlemen were engaging in alcohol, drugs, prostitution, all that stuff, but it had to stay hidden because they had to appear perfect in the eyes of the Victorians. So yeah, that is uh, part two video and we're gonna go straight into the next part, which is gonna be part three looking at chapter five and chapter six if you have enjoyed this please do like and share and subscribe to my channel make sure other people are getting these free resources they're right there for you they're going to help you with your exams i'll catch you there in the next one